Uh, I'm doing the demonstration today. I'm doing it on finishes, and uh, I had to change my lighting around this morning because it's a lot darker. I don't have as much light coming through this window behind me as I did when I set this up yesterday. Um, I'm talking about finishes here. Um, a lot of people have lots of questions about this museum quality finish that I use. And, and a lot of people ask me about light, uh, lacquer too. I'm going to kind of run over and, uh, and, and, and go through some of these items. Um, one thing that I want to talk about first is the first step to a great finish is uh, sanding. And uh, unfortunately, all those wood tinners, we've been taught to hate sanding from everybody. You watch these demos, they, everybody says the same thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, we all hate sanding, and yep, I mean, nothing worse to do but sand. And I, I kind of take a little offense with that. I, I, I don't really hate sanding. Um, I, I find it just as enjoyable as the rest of the process of making a piece. Because I think when you sand, you really, you really bring out the grain. And uh, I, I think you, you, you need to embrace sanding. It, uh, it is sanding is the second most important thing you can do with your, with your, your art. In, in my opinion, um, the most important part of a turning is form. Um, you, if you don't have the right form, uh, I don't care how you sand or whatever you do, it doesn't look right when you're done. So I think form is the most important thing you can do in making a piece. I think the second most important is sanding because if you have a horrible finish on there, which I see it posted on social media all the time, um, pieces that there, there's sanding marks in them, there's tool marks they didn't sand out. Um, sanding marks that they put in because they were sanding while they had the lathe on, like the inside of a bowl, and you, you start burnishing the wood, and it, now those marks are just as hard to get out as tool marks are. And people think they don't realize that they've incorporated those into their piece by sanding with the lathe on. So um, I just have a flat board here, but if I'm if I'm working on a board, I mean a board. If I'm working on a bowl or a hollow form, I don't sand with the lathe on. Um, I I uh, I. I, I use power tools, but I sand with the lathe off to get a nice even finish, especially on a bowl. The inside and outside of a bowl, I don't turn the lathe on until maybe I'm up to 320. Then I might turn the lathe on and, and get a, a nice finish from top to bottom. But when you, you've seen my stuff, everything I do is at natural edges. It just doesn't work to, to sand with the lathe on anyways. Uh, but I think that's taught me a valuable lesson that uh, I can sand with the lathe off probably as fast as most people do with the lathe on and just working my way around the whole bowl and going through all the grits. Um, you know, if you're sanding and you, uh, you know, you hit that 220, that seems to be the, pole, the the grit you hit. You hit 220 and then all of a sudden you start seeing sanding marks or tool marks that pop up down in those corners. Uh, at that point, you got to just stop and back up a grit or two and take them out and then keep moving forward, um, you know, and then uh, the same thing happens when you, uh, sometimes when you apply your sanding sealer suddenly, some of these sanding marks pop back up, you know, turning marks and sanding marks. And, and you know, when your sanding still is dry, you need to stop back up and take those out. So sanding is one of the most important things you can do to your piece. So with that, I have a piece here that, um, that I, I uh, it's some ambrosia maple that I've sanded to 320. That's my process. Everything I do, I, I, I do the same thing. I, I sand it to 320. And then uh, at that point, I'm gonna put on a sanding sealer. Um, my sanding sealer um, is, uh, hang on, I have a picture here, I think. Like, there's my sanding sealer. I mix denatured alcohol and, and shellac, clear gloss shellac. I mix it half and half. And uh, that's my, my sanding sealer, and I use this on everything I do. Um, the... Um, let me, let me get back to this. So at this point, I've gone through and I've, I've, uh, I've got the sand in the 320. I, I don't have any marks in there. And at this point, I would put on my sanding sealer. Um, let, me, uh, let me show you. Here's my sanding sealer. This is I mix it up. And a lot of people ask me, yeah, I, I tried your sanding sealer, and the next day it was all separated. Um, it should separate. Um, there's DNA and there's shellac in there, and you need to shake it and mix them back up. After a while, I mean, I'll mix up. I mix up. I think I just mixed this up earlier this week, so that's what I mix up at a time, about that much. When it gets to the point where it's not separated anymore, it's because your DNA has all evaporated. 
and the only thing you have left in your shellac and maybe just a little bit of DNA. So at, at, at the point where it stops separating, like tomorrow morning you get up and after you've used it and it's it's not separated, you probably time to dump that into your shellac and start over again or throw it away. And uh, I have a jar I put all my old shellac in that I use for other stuff. So, but that's that's probably the time to throw it out and the remix it. So at this point, um, I have uh, I have this my piece here sanded to um, let's let this is a little washed out there. And I might have to just shut this off. Let's go with that. Yeah, that's better. So um, I have this. Uh, Sanded the 320. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put on my uh, my sanding sealer, and uh, and I'm going to put this on generously over the whole thing, and I'm going to put it on until all these spots stop soaking it up. So it, when I sit there and wait for 20 or 30 seconds, I don't have a dry spot. You know, I, I don't think you can see that here. Uh, but sometimes you get these these dry areas here where the spalting is, and it's drier than the rest, and it sucks it up. And I'll just sit there, and, and I'll just keep applying it to those areas um, until it stops absorbing it, until the whole thing is evenly wet, uh, and, and and keep going through it. Now, that's that can sometimes take that can sometimes take a half an hour to to do all that. Um, you uh but it's something you need to do and then i'll stop back and i'll take a look at it and wipe it a little bit and make sure that it looks like it's that that sanding sealer is drying evenly across the whole piece um now what can happen if you're working on uh here, let me, and i always blow in these before i uh, seal them up keeps it from uh from evaporating i do that with all my stuff and and setting up if you've, if you've got something like this, this is one of these pieces. This is what I, I have done that uh, museum quality finish on. If you've got something like this, this right here is all in drain. This is going to absorb and absorb and absorb. And this whole top here, because it's in drain, it's just going to keep absorbing it. This here, the side drain, is, is not going to absorb much when I put that on, the, my sanding sealer. So I'll put it on this whole thing, and the first thing you'll notice is here it's all dry, and up here it's all dry, and it's kind of wet here and here. And I'll have to keep applying it to these areas on the top and the insides here for sometimes a half an hour. To just keep putting it on there and keep putting it on there until it finally stops absorbing it. Because if you don't do that, I don't care what finish you put on, except maybe if you're just doing like... Uh, uh, you know, Grand Rapids grit, you know, some kind of a, of, of a gritty polish, you're not going to notice it then. But if you're putting on anything like a lacquer or polyurethane or shellac, you're going to see the exact same thing in your piece. It's going to be nice and shiny here, and it's going to be all dull and dry in these areas. So I will keep putting on that sanding sealer. And, and like I said, some pieces, especially you got ingrain, you'll be sitting here doing it for a half an hour. So get the radio on and just keep going. I might walk away and let it dry a little bit and then come back and put some more on. And then when I I think I'm finally there, like I just did with this piece here, I'll take my sand, my uh, I'll take a piece of uh, paper towel and I'll dry it all off and let it set. So that's that's my first step to doing for doing a um, every piece. Every piece I do, I get to this point right here where I've got 320 and I've got sanding sealer and I put that sanding sealer on generously until it doesn't absorb it anymore. Um, at that point, I let it set. If, if you've been putting it on for half an hour, you probably need to let that set for two or three days so that it cures. Otherwise, you're just going to clog up your sandpaper when you try to, to go back over it. So I'll let it set, and then uh, a couple of days later, you know, when I get back to it, I'll pull it out. Now, this is one that I did that to earlier this week. So it's, it's the same wood, and uh, it's got one... It's got one coat of my sanding sealer on. So at that point, I'm going to bring that back out a couple of days later. And uh, so this was sanded to 320. So now at this point, I'm going to bring this to 400. Um, what I would do, typically, I would back up to 320 again. Sometimes I might even back up to 220. Um, depending on how things look, you know, if it, it, how, how it's set up. 
Um, how many really punky areas I had, I might want to back up a little bit and try to smooth out those punky areas. But on this one, it's pretty dry, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to just quickly sand this to 400. Okay, so pardon the noise. <laughs> So there's 320. I'll make sure that my paper isn't getting all gummed up and gritted up. Because if it's all gummed and gritted up, you're probably going to want to like run some stew all over this to take off some of that gummy part. But if you let it dry for a couple of days, it should be hard. It shouldn't gum up your sand paper. So and this is not gumming up. So I know I've got a nice clean sanding job here. So that was 320. And now I'm going to throw some 400 on. <laughs> And that is that. Let me uh, get, let me blow this out because I see I got I got it in the hole here. So now, so now I'm uh, I'm at 400 grit. I've got my sanding sealer on there. At this point, I would go on. I would come this far with every piece I do, and then decide, okay, what am I going to do with this piece? Am I going to put a poly wipe on her? Am I going to put uh, a Danish oil on there, or am I going to lacquer it, or am I going to do my my uh, my museum quality finish? I get to this point in everything I do, and then I decide, well, you say I already know, but at that point, I will do the next step, because getting this far in everything is going to make that next step go on and, and appear so much better if you've done this whole process and gotten this nice and sealed, because this is sealed, it's, it's extremely smooth, it feels hard, it's not going to absorb much anymore because I've already filled all the pores with, with my sanding sealer. So at this point, I'm going to put on my, uh, my museum quality finish. Um, and let me uh, let's see, I have uh, my, my museum quality finish, which is mineral spirits, tongue oil, and polyurethane, clear. Um, those three mix evenly. One part of each. Um, I'll, I'll usually mix up just what I need to do the piece I'm doing. Um, you know, and if I'm doing like that big, like that big vase there, I would probably mix up more like a cup. But if I'm just doing, um, you know, a little piece like this, I, I, I only did a couple of tablespoons of each to um, to do this demonstration. So I, I've I've mixed that up in a little can. One I saved one of the cans from uh, from before. And uh, so then I'll put that on. So this is my MQF, my, my museum quality finish with the three parts. Um, a question, Doug? Yes. Um, you always use gloss on the? Yes. The thing? Okay. Yes, you want gloss. You could put a satin in there. You're, you're, it's, it'll just give it a satin finish. But the, the way... The way that this is going to get put on, I can get a satin finish like that. That's kind of what's on this piece here. I, I did this with the gloss, but I got a satin finish because I just didn't keep applying it. You know, you can at one point you can just stop and say, "Hey, I like that the way it looks, and it's not too glossy." So, but yeah, it's got to be clear. And the same thing with uh, with the sanding sealer. Um, make sure it's clear gloss, um, and make sure <laughs> I, I just did this. Uh, make sure that when you pick it up, you don't get their sanding sealer. I accidentally bought that two days ago because this can was empty. So I went to buy more, and I bought I bought the, uh, it says, uh, I don't know. Too much I'm light. Sure. Too much light. Too much light, yeah. Um, it says, uh, here, let me, I can put this here, or main. The, uh, yeah, that's, that's already pre-mixed. It's pre-mixed. It's like, I mean, you can tell too, as soon as I opened it, I knew I got the wrong stuff because it's like gasoline. And uh, regular shellac is more like the consistency of cream, you know, like a, a, a heavy milk. But uh, it was so thin, it's like, oh, I can still use that. I just don't, you wouldn't mix it. You would use this, you would put this right straight on the way it was. So so look at what you're buying. Get clear for the, for the my sanding sealer. And I use clear polyurethane for the, uh, for the MQF, the, the mix. What so about now, wax? What about wax or no wax? 
Um, the this is probably, it's probably got wax in it. I I know I've seen that before where they oh make sure it's the the wax free and all that. Um, I'm sure you can go to Woodcraft and find a shellac that's wax free. Um, I just buy this from my local hardware store, you know, and that was kind of one of the things that that um, that made me start talking about what I do because when I see people describing these types of uh, of sealers they're like oh yeah you have to use a lint free cloth and you have to use make sure you're using um, um, you know wax free shellac and whatever you do don't get just your regular off the shelf tongue oil you know don't don't get just regular uh, regular tongue oil like this off the shelf you have to go and buy the pure tongue oil and it's like you know what I don't do any of that. I go to my local hardware store, and all these they have all these, you know, and it's two miles away. Um, I don't, it's right off the shelf, and I get a great finish by using the regular stuff I get from my hardware store. So uh, that's why I start talking about this, you know, and they, they talk about uh, um, make sure you got a lint free cloth when you're doing your uh, putting, um, applying this stuff and wiping it all down. I, I use paper towels. And uh, I was going to have, let me grab one here. <laughs> I use paper towels. I have not bought a roll of paper towels for my shop here probably in four years. My wife goes through paper towels like they're free. She takes them and she lines these things out and she lays on her eggplant or her salmon or whatever. And then she puts another whole roll on top and then she wraps them. And at the end, she throws away paper towel like this by the mass. I just save it, I set it, I dry it out, and I reuse it. So I'm not even using clean paper towels when I do these processes. I'm using eggplant, you see it's eggplant. This has got eggplant juices all over. She just did it the other day. And it works just fine. So I guess I'm debunking some of the of, of the things I've seen that, you know, make sure you do this and don't buy this and all that. You know what, I've done it with just stuff I've had at hand here and it's worked just fine. And I have some nice pieces that have won me awards um, to, to prove that, you know, you don't have to get pure tongue oil and you don't have to get waxless shellac and all that. You can you can use what you get from your local store. So here's my shellac that I mixed up a couple of days ago when I was getting ready for this demonstration. Um, now I'm going to, I've got this all sanded to 400, so, and I'm going to go with my museum quality finish. So. I'm going to put this on in pretty much the same way that I would put on my sanding sealer. I'm going to put this on and make sure that it's absorbing evenly through the whole surface. And it should, if I did my last step properly, it should. I shouldn't see dry spots because I've already gone beyond that when I did my uh, sanding sealer and I put it on there. So I put this on there and I get it nice and thick or generous. I won't say thick, but generous. I don't want it dripping all over my leg and make sure it's nice and sealed. Um, if I was trying to do the end here, um, I would have a lot to do because that's in grain. I should have, I would have had to uh, lay on my sanding sealer over and over and over again. But I'm just doing this surface here. So, and it's gone on and it's nice and even and it looks good. So at this point, I go and I take, let me get the right one here. After I've got that on there and all sealed, I'm going to use um, this Norton sandpaper. I get this from Woodcraft. Uh, it's a soft touch sanding sponge. Um, I can probably put that on the screen here. Um, they have 1,000 P800, so I'm guessing this is 800. I don't know how it would be full. So I, I would, after I have this ready to go, I take the 800, I cut a little piece off it, and I'm going to just sand this in lightly. And go through and, and, and work it into the grain. Um, and I don't have to do this a lot because it's not going to go very deep. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll go with the grain if it's possible. If it's a burl, then I just do circular motions. And go around the whole piece, inside and out, if it's a bowl or a vessel. And, and just kind of work that in until it's looking good. Um, and then I'll take some of my... Uh, some of my eggplant paper towel and I'm just going to I'm going to dry that off and I'm not going to dry it completely but I can dry right now and I see I've got a nice sheen here it's it's um I don't I wish 
I don't know if I can if I can see that. Hang on, hang on. We can we can see some sheen. That's for sure. Let me uh, let me go this route here. Let me see if I can get this camera on here. So while you're doing that, Ruby asked a question. She says, did I miss something? Does he mix the tongue oil and the shellac? <laughs> no, no, the tongue oil with the, uh, with the mineral spirits and the, uh, and the uh, polyurethane. That's my museum quality finish, those three pieces. Um, the picture before that, um, that was my sanding sealer the shellac and the denatured alcohol. So, yeah, so, yeah, get, keep them straight. I have a, um, I have a handout that I will, I will, I'll email out. I was looking at it and I need to make one change to it. Um, so, let's see now if I can. Hang on, I'm moving back. Here's my, uh, I get this camera on here. See now here on, you can see the sheen here a little bit. Yep. And what I, what I would do here is um, kind of look at this. You can already see that it's got a nice shine to it. And this is the, the first step. It's all nice and even all across. Um, so that's, the, this is the first step of putting this on. This is still a little wet because I just did this. Um, but you know, I, I'll get it on there and then I'll sand it in with this 800 grit foam back paper. Dry it off. I, I'm not going to dry it. I mean, you could just keep drying it, but once you see it's got a nice cover and it just is little, maybe just a little wet, that's good. I'm going to let that set then. For uh, I'll let that set for the uh, for a couple of days until that cures, or at least a day. So so that's the the second step. Um, and it's already got. I mean, that right there. That's a pretty nice finish. That's a nice soft sheen on there. You you could call that. Um, you know, you could say, Hey, I, I like that right there. I don't need to do any more to it. So, but, um, so Tom Pennington's got a question. He says, does, does he let it dry before sanding or wet sand? I'm not quite sure what he's referring to. Yes. Well, no, this paper, it was still wet. So I, I, I put the, uh, I put the sealer on there, my MQFs. And then while it was still wet, I sanded it in. I wet sanded it in with this 800 grit foam back paper. So I sanded it all in, and uh, until it feels like it's nice and evenly sanded, I didn't catch, I didn't miss any areas. I think think that helps to work. That well, it does. It definitely works it into the top of the wood grain. So you you wet sand that in with this foam back paper while it's still wet. Then after you're done, dry it off with the uh, with the uh, with the paper towel. You know, I just lightly dried it off, and then. That's step two. So um, at this point, I'm done for the day on this. So I'm gonna, I would put this away, and uh, and then uh, in a day or two, bring it back out. So now here I got one that I have done those two steps to earlier this week. So this has got my sanding sealer, and it's got one application of my museum quality finish on it. So now I'm going to do practically the same thing again. I'm going to get my, uh, I'm going to get my, uh, my, my finish out, which I seem to have, oh, it's right here. I get my finish out and, uh, and I'm going to spill it all over me. <laughs> but I got enough in there to finish this. So then I'm going to take this. And I'm not going to sand or anything. I'm going to immediately just put on another coat of my finish here. Do you always apply it with a brush? Yeah, I do. Okay. I don't. Yeah, I always put it on with a with a foam brush. Probably because I buy these things in like 50 packs. So, so I put that on, and I'm once again I'm putting this on generously, and I'm, I'm looking over again, make sure I'm not missing any spots. And and now I'm going to go to the next grit up on this foam back paper. This is 
12 to 1500 so 1200 and i'm gonna cut a little piece off it and and i'm gonna take this 1200 now and i'm gonna work this into my grit into my into my piece And I'm, if you can go with the grain, go with the grain. You know, once again, if you got a burl, then you're just going to do circular motions. I don't think it really matters at this point because 1,200 grit, you uh, you're not going to probably see any of the, any of the lines from this. So then, after I've got this worked in nicely, I'm going to get out a piece of my uh, my my paper towel, and I'm just going to kind of wipe this back off again. Until I see that it's got a nice, nice little sheen to it there. And at this point, I'm gonna let that dry. And I can put this back up there. So, so you can see on here, it's got a nice, a nice sheen on there. It's get, it's mm -hmm. got a little more of a gloss to it. So I'm gonna let that dry now. And I, I didn't completely take that off. I, there's a little bit on there. I'm sure you can see my I smudge it there because it's 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 got just a little bit of uh it's just got a little film of that MQF on the top. I'm gonna let that dry, and at this point, it's gonna dry about that shiny. Um, it's gonna probably it'll probably uh, soften a little bit, and then uh, at this point, it, it's it's likely done if you don't want to get it really glossy. If you want to get it glossy, then I would just keep repeating these last steps over and over again. Um, I had a piece here that I think I, I think I just sold it that I had done four coats after four of these final coats, and it was pretty glossy. And uh, that's four coats like this is really going to get that glossy. Right now, this is going to dry to a really really nice satin sheen, and and you're done. That's it. How much dry time do you give it? one day um, well I take that back uh, one day before I put another coat on um, this thing is going to stink for about a week so before I brought it to the gallery and put it on the shelf I would let it sit in my shop or sit in somewhere where it's not going to get too dusty you don't want it to get dusty at this point so put it in a dust free area and let it dry for a day and then uh, then after that I would let it dry for probably a week I'd let that dry for a week before I brought it to the gallery because it stinks. You know, like even though you're using odorless mineral spirits, and that's why they this this came from the um, AAW magazine. It was February like 2017 or 2018, um, and it's called their Museum Quality Finish, and it's very similar to what I did here. And um, uh, I forget now why I was saying this. So I blame that on COVID, <laughs> COVID fog. <laughs> So, but anyways, Tom, it's in the mag. What's that? Tom Pennington wants to know if uh, the temperature of the shop makes any difference. It probably would slow down the drying time. Um, I don't know if it would prevent it from drying. Um, right now, my shop here is, well, my shop's probably right now 62 degrees. It's pretty, pretty nice. Um, and that's kind of where it's at most of the winter. Um, so that's that's a pretty good temperature for for doing any kind of a finish. But I, I probably if you were getting down in the 40s or something, I'm sure that would slow down the drying time. But I don't know if it would affect the overall quality afterwards. Once it's cured, I think it would be fine. Ruby wants to know what the proportions are of the tongue oil, DNA, and polyurethane. Even even portions, one part of each. Doug, when you're doing your big hollow forms or bowls, do you also do that finishing on the lathe? Yes, I, I do all my finishing on the lathe. And then when I'm all done, I cut the bottom off and then I have to finish that, which takes another four or five days, you know, to finish the bottom, unless you're lacquering it, then you can do it pretty quick. But with this museum quality finish, you gotta, you gotta cut the bottom off and then you have to go through all those processes to get it to look the same as the outside. So you probably, you know, have, enough, have another week of work to uh, to get it all up to the same, or so, I, I have done the museum quality finish on the whole hollow form, and then lacquer the bottom. <laughs> so, you, when do you use lacquer? Do you use lacquer on any of your museum? I have lacquered one of these pieces after it's cured. You know, I look at it 30 days later and like you know. 
uh, I don't like the way it looks, I'll go in and I'll put my um, my sanding sealer on there. I'll, I'll give it a coat of that. I'll I'll lightly um, sand it in like with this 1200 uh, sandpaper, dry it off, and shoot it with lacquer. Um, um, shellac is a, a great medium between everything. So um, I, I, I heard somebody else say that you could just put lacquer right over this after it's dry. Um, I don't know if I've done that. I think I've always put another coat of my sanding seal around just to ensure that I got a good bond, bonding agent. So, and this is already starting to, to turn into a, a nice gloss. Or a, Question. A, yeah. Um, do you ever wear gloves for what you're doing there? No. Okay. I probably should, huh? Uh, it depends on whether you want the ends of your fingers or not. <laughs> I haven't lost the ends of any of them yet. So. <laughs> but no, I, I don't. It's, it, I just you know, use my hands. and I mean, I'm not getting this on doing this. I'm not getting on my hands that much. I'm using a brush and, and I'm using a paper towel. So um, it's not uh, it's doesn't seem like I get much on my hands, except for when I dump the whole can over and I'm trying to grab it. Um, that cauliflower uh, paper towel, you might want to put some of that in the club store so people Yeah, I was off. thinking about patenting that. <laughs> yeah, I think this is eggplant, cauliflower, she doesn't have to dry that much, but eggplant and salmon, she has to oh, dry yeah. all that. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that might be part of my, that might be a special part of my process that I don't know how much is adding to the final end game. Yeah. So I would think the salmon would add a lot to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I usually use the salmon more when I'm wiping off the uh, sanding sealer as opposed to uh, the spinal uh, grade here. So now you can see how this is starting to dry. It's still got a nice, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's got a nice sheen to it. I, I, I would be happy with that right there and, and probably call it good without putting any more coats on. Um, you know, and you, I think when I first was doing this, I was trying to do a final coat of just, um, I would just put the put it on there without the sandpaper and then try to get a nice, like you would do a poly wipe probably, and a wipe on poly and tried to get one smooth coat on there and let it dry, but I never liked the way it looked. It didn't, just never came out right. And I find that if, you know, for my last coat, I always, I always use the sandpaper, put it on there, work it in, wipe it off, and, uh, and call it good because I can feel this is getting tacky now so it's starting to dry and it's probably gonna it's probably gonna dry with that sheen on there so which is uh, I, I can live with that and then with lacquer you know if I'm going to lacquer something uh, it would be before I did the first coat of that you know I do my sanding sealer and then I sand it from 320 up to 400 and then shoot shoot it with lacquer, and um, it would be uh, that would be good. As a matter of fact, I can I can do that right now. Let's take that one. Here's here's my number one. So this has got sanding sealer on it only. We just did that an hour or twenty minutes ago. So I can. I can take this, and because you just did it, it might be a little tacky, so I'll just take a little steel wool, work that back off, get it nice and smooth. Hit that with some 400. Blow it off. My, uh, what I use for lacquer, let me see if you can see this from, well, I can do it with this other one here. Did, still on? No, oh, it shut off. Hang on here. My lacquer system is the Fuji Semi-Pro. Um, 
you can, I think you can, I bought it on sale a couple of years ago or three years ago maybe for three hundred dollars or something like that. Um, and basically, I bought that because it, it had really great ratings and it wasn't that much more than the than the one they sell at Woodcraft. So it's got it's a non bleed head. So when I turn it on, it's, it, there's no air blowing through it. Um, it, it, it. It feeds it when you pull the trigger. So let me let me shoot this real fast for the heck of it here. So let's see, when you turn this on here, I'm going to turn this on, and this thing sounds like a vacuum cleaner running. And what I do when I, when I, when I lacquer, I'll, I'll lacquer at the top. I'll, I'll come through, and I'll, I'll, like, lacquer this much. And then I'll move down, and so about halfway across what I previously lacquered. So that every time I go through, I'm, I'm covering half of what I lacquered the first time. So the first time I do this, I'm going to come, like, half off the top. And then I'm going to move down, and then I'll come here. And I'll work my way all the way to the bottom. So I'm kind of hitting every area twice when I lacquer this. So here, let me lacquer this. So there's my lacquering. And typically what I do if I've got a bowl or something on there, um, I'll, I'll lacquer the outside with the bowl spinning at 159 RPMs a minute. Um, and and, and I, I've got that figured out. I got my, my gun adjusted that I can shoot it and I can watch it go around three times. One, two, three, and then stop it and then move up halfway. And I can go up the whole backside and then I'll shut the lathe off. And, uh, and I'll lacquer the whole inside, which if it's a really big bowl, it's a complete pain in the ass because you got overspray, you're inside of a bowl, the, the, the fumes can't get out, and they're just in there causing more overspray. Um, so it's, it's a, it can be a tedious process. If it's a really small bowl, you can just go right through it. So, But I'll, I'll go through that, and, uh, and then when I get it where I think it looks like it's all good, I'll turn the lathe on at the slow speed I can go, which is 125, and let it spin while it's drying and that helps prevent runs because like you i don't know if you can see that but i put this on pretty thick and i can see it rippling as i was going across it um you know so i'll, I'll always turn it on afterwards and just let it spin for a couple minutes while it dries um so but that right there that's pretty much dry right now um let me turn this back on again here this thing i wish this would stay on So how do you determine which ones you're going to lacquer and which one you're going to do the other finish? I mean, if you're turning everything for the, um, you know, the, the uh, shoot, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm drawing the gallery? Away. Everything for the gallery? gallery. Yeah, yeah. Um, if it's food safe, I'll use the museum quality finish because that's a food safe and it's worked its way into the grain a little bit. Um, I mean, it's not a really... Um, not really a convenient food safe for the consumer because if they wear through it, uh, I mean, it, it could, if they scuff it up and stuff, it's not so easy to just put some Danish oil on and redo it. But, and if I want to, if I don't want a high gloss, like you can see this right here, um, this is pretty glossy. And this is probably, I mean, that's probably almost dry. In, in another minute or so, I'll be able to touch that, and it'll be dry. That's how glossy that's going to be with just one coat of lacquer. Um, if if I don't want it really glossy, like that piece behind me, this piece here, I didn't want that high gloss on it. I I, I wanted more of a of a of a satin finish, so I went with the other. So that's kind of how I determine that. What what finish do I want it really glossy, or do I want a satin finish? Is it going to be food safe? Um, most of my food safe stuff I do, I use, I use that museum quality finish because it is food safe once it cures after 30 days. Um, and it still looks good. It can still be glossy and be food safe. So I can tell somebody, um, you know, I, I can, I can tell a customer, yeah, 
it's food safe. You can put food and safe in there. It's not going to hurt the bowl. It's not going to hurt you. Um, you wouldn't want to do that with lacquer, you know. So, and if you do, like, before I used to do my food safe, safe stuff with, uh, I would use, um, like, the Grand Rapids grid or I would use um, Danish oil or something like that. And if you don't get that gloss. And you know what? If you want to sell something in a gallery, people gravitate towards shiny items. They're like crows, you know. They're, they're going to pick up the shiny things. Um, you know, the other ones just tend to sit there um, on your shelf for years, you know. So let's see if this is a... Uh, Let's see if this is dry. Oh, it's not quite dry. I left a little spot there. You can see that. So, but it's close. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of uh, that's that that's my setup. That's what I do on everything I do. It's one of those two usually, and um, you know, it works for me. It'll probably work for you. Hey, dog, got a question, it's Jim? Yes. The, the the type of lacquer you can buy the watt is a watco or something like that lacquer in a spray can uh, but there's also a an acrylic lacquer that the automotive people use which have you used either no um, here let me grab what I use I used to use a Valspar and they got bought out by they got Velspar got bought out by Newtone here, um, and so I get this at the um, Sherwin Williams. It's right next to Woodcraft. They used to be over on Forty Fourth Street, um, and they claim that this is the same as the one I was using before. But I don't think I don't think it's true. Um, before I was using a Velspar, and it had a uh, ultraviolet inhibitor in it. To, and it helped to keep things from fading, and I think it worked because I have some box out of here that I shot with that with that uh, stuff like five or six years ago that's still red, um, sitting in our kitchen up here. And uh, this doesn't say that it's got a UV inhibitor on it, and I can't imagine you would make a product and spend the extra time to make sure it's a UV inhibitor and not put it on the label. So I don't think this has, I don't think it's the same as the Valspar that I was buying before. So, so yeah, this is, this is what I've been using. I cut this three parts lacquer with one part lacquer thinner, you know, and I, I mix up, you know, probably uh, two cups at a time, you know, a cup and a half of this and then a half a cup of uh, lacquer thinner. So that's, that's my lacquer. And, and I had some, this is, this is um, gloss. Um, I had some, uh, some satin before when it was Valspar you had to tell them what sheen you wanted and I would get 80 sheen which was pretty glossy and I had like some 60 sheen if I wanted like a satin not quite so glossy so but, hey yeah. Doug if you go to Sherwin Williams there um and tell them you're with the other group the Grand Rapids Woodworkers you know or, yeah you get a heck of a discount they don't ask to see a card or nothing, but you get a, they're set up with them. They had a demo, Sherwin Williams demo come in and, and I forget the discount, but I bought a lot of stuff there, including my sprayer and you get a heck of a good discount. Hmm. Okay. I know at times they, the, some guys there will give me a discount, like a pretty significant discount. And some guys don't, most of them don't. <laughs> Tom McDonald used to live next door to the uh, regional rep or whatever. And Tom McDonald got that set up with him. But yes, it's a heck of a discount. Um, I think we could try to make some connections so that Turner's Club could get it without one. But you don't have to show your card, but I get everything there because the discount's unbelievable. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll remember that next time. <laughs> Any other questions? Wow, it's pretty quiet out there. Okay. They're all like dying that. to go into the shop and try it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can get all this at your local Ace Hardware, so it's... Go down there, except for the 
except for the eggplant paper towel. You'll have to make that yourself. Or go out on a limb and just use paper towel. I don't know. <laughs> hey, hey, Doug, there's a yes. comment. There's a comment asking if uh, you use a Beal buffing system at the end. Um, I have a Beal buffing system that I bought, and uh, I did not. I, I, I've never tried it on this museum quality finish, uh, basically because I like the finish when it's done, you know. And with my lacquer, people look at that and they think that I did use a Beal buffing system on it. And it's like, no, it's just, uh, it's just lacquer, you know. It's, it comes out glossy. So I have a Beal buffing system here that's pretty much been used twice, and I never use it again because I, I, I like the finish with, uh, I like the finish I get. You know, with lacquer, sometimes if I really want it shining smooth, uh, after I after I do like I just did today, um, I'll wait a couple of days and I'll run over it with some quadruple aught steel wool and just lightly scuff it, take off the lumps and bumps, and make sure that there is no dust in the shop, and uh, and give it one more coat, and it can you can really get a nice a really nice quality finish that looks like it's been buff to the end you know automotive style finish so um uh, doug also sure sure one williams carries the two-part bleach and it's terribly inexpensive they come in gallons uh, you get a gallon of a a gallon of b so much less expensive than buying the little zinzer bottles at woodcraft yeah i know you mentioned that before i don't use that very much i did use it last month though so yeah, for next time I need it, that's where I'll be going to get it. So yeah, I, I think people don't realize that you go to the a regular finish store like that. I'm sure if you went to, uh, you know, uh, Sharon Williams, what's the other one up there? On, I'm thinking of Craft and 29th Street. Anyways, you get their their prices is is just as good as the the big box stores, if not better, and, and you might be getting a better better product. So. <clears throat> So, well, thank you, Doug. Um, yeah. I've always had a hard time with finishing, and this is going to help me a lot. Yep, give it a try. If you don't like it, hey, don't do it. If if it looks good, then uh, uh, there you have another uh, another weapon in your back pocket that you can use. You know, all these all these demonstrations are, are another weapon. You know, that you can pull out uh, when needed to uh, to uh, try to enhance your product. You know. Um, I, I don't try every every demonstration. I don't always try every month, but you know I, I, I have it in my back pocket and try to remember it. So when I when I when I do need to do something, it's like oh yeah, I think I remember we had a demo on that. I'll give it a shot. So, uh, Doug, uh, on 29th Street at Sevens. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. I and was going to. They carry a tremendous selection of modern masters. Reactive paint also, very inexpensive. They're out of business. Sevens? Yeah. Wow, oh. when did that happen? On 29th Street, that's not a Sevens anymore. And the one on Fuller isn't there either. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, hey, Doug. Doug. Go ahead. Um, I learned a MQF variety from Fine Woodworking which used boiled linseed oil in place of the tongue oil. And your comments on that. <clears throat> I've heard that. I've never tried it. Um, I, I think it's just a cheaper way of doing it because the tongue oil is more expensive than boiled linseed oil. Um, I haven't tried it. I'm not an expert on oils and stuff. Um, seems to me it, somebody I heard talking about that was Jeff Hornick. I was watching one of his demos once on finishes and I, it would be interesting to get him to do a demo for our club. Ron, you need to work on that for us. <laughs> he, he is super knowledgeable on all that, knows about all the chemicals and do's and don'ts and all that. And I'm not that. I only know what I do. I don't know everything else. So he seems to know everything else about it. What, Sam, Doug, you, want me, you want me to do John Singleton's job? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could have it done this afternoon if you want. I'd be curious what he charges to do a demonstration on all his finishes. I don't know if we'd need one right away since I just did this, but maybe maybe later next year. Or maybe when you do your um, 
your the Ron's retreat. retreat, and he's up here. We can get him to swing by our guild and do a, do a, a, a demonstration for us. Uh, I'll have it done for you. All right, work with work with John Singleton on that. <laughs> hey, Ron, thank you. The... I appreciate it. Now you only got eleven months to go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one finish spot that does pretty good. They mix everything there. Uh, the paint spot. By Leonard and uh, Walker, I believe it is. They're reasonable and they do all the finishes. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would like to find a finish that I know has a UV inhibitor in it. Because uh, I don't think this one does. And I do think that's helpful to keep the, the color of your of your piece from fading. Uh, and uh, so that's I've, I've, been look, I've been looking for one of those. Because I, I see some pieces I've done in the house that... I thought, you know, they look like they've lost their color. And those pieces that I had done before with that Valspar that, that listed right on it had a UV inhibitor, it seemed to hold color a lot better over time. One, One thing you, about that paint spot, too, is if you got to match a, a color or a varnish or a stain, you take it in there and they'll match it right up for you. You take a piece of that and a piece of wood you're going to put it on, and they'll they'll mix a finish till they got a match for you. Okay. Cool. Okay. Well, I think uh, we can say that this meeting is officially over with. Um, I'll leave the room open for a little bit here so that. Um... <laughs>